Do you guys have any ideas on what we should write about for our next set of blog posts? I don't know. I've been feeling pretty frustrated lately. I feel like everyone keeps talking about free speech and civil discourse without really knowing what it means. It's like if we just say free speech enough times, it'll magically come into existence. Right. I feel like free speech and civil discourse are just so confusing and so overused. They've become really overwhelming and no one wants to talk about them or read about it or even engage in it. Maybe that's true. But there's still some really important topics. If we're going to opt into this community, we have to know how to respect each other and solve problems together. And that doesn't mean we all have to agree with each other all the time, but we at least need to be able to talk and listen to each other when we don't agree. Yeah, I think that's the best part of going to a school with people from such diverse backgrounds. We have so much to learn from each other if we just listen. So if we know this is a problem, how can we do a better job of talking about it? Oh, I have an idea. Why don't we send out weekly emails with information that's relevant to students? Okay, <laughs> yeah. Bad idea. What if we host a series of educational events? It's not gonna work. Well, they're not all like that. Guys, what if we just made a cartoon? I've always wanted to be in a cartoon. We can make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly like I would have expected it to be. I know, right? And we have background music. Anyway, where should we get started? Oh, I have a good example. Okay, the other day in class, our discussion started getting pretty heated, and one of the guys in my class started launching all these personal attacks at the person he disagreed with. It was really inappropriate, and when my professor tried to intervene, he pulled the free speech card on her. But his comments would definitely qualify as hate speech, so there's no way they're protected under free speech laws. Actually, according to the Supreme Court ruling Brandenburg v. Ohio, the government cannot punish inflammatory speech unless that speech is directed at inciting or producing imminent lawless action. So, those remarks from your classmates sound like they were definitely inappropriate for a classroom setting, and your professor certainly had the right to intervene in order to maintain a constructive learning environment. But the First Amendment actually protects most hate speech, no matter how offensive the content, as long as it doesn't cross certain lines. Really? Wow, I definitely didn't think hate speech would be protected under free speech laws. Is there any kind of speech the First Amendment doesn't protect? According to Erwin Chemerinsky, freedom of speech doesn't protect, first and foremost, child porn and deceptive advertising. It also doesn't include the incitement of illegal activities, true threats, which is threatening communication with the intent to follow through, such as threatening to hurt another person, and lastly, harassment. However, there is no clarity as to where speech on campus crosses into harassment. At a private university. Aren't the rules different here than, say, if I went to a public university? Good point. Technically, the First Amendment only prohibits the government from infringing on your free speech rights. It doesn't apply to private persons or organizations. But private universities do have to abide by state laws guaranteeing free speech. Specifically in California, we have a provision called the Leonard Law that prevents private institutions from obstructing individuals' freedom of expression. This gets a little tricky because universities also have the right to take disciplinary action if a student violates their code of conduct. But it's unlikely that a student would face any legal consequences for their speech, unless it fell into one of the categories we mentioned. Well, our speech might be legally protected, but that doesn't mean we should walk around saying whatever we want just because it's legal. If I see a poor old lady drop all her money on the ground, it's technically legal for me to pick it up and keep it. That doesn't mean it's ethical. Sometimes what's legal and what's ethical are two different things. Yeah, I think that's what we were getting at earlier when we talked about what it means to be part of a community. Even though hate speech might be legally protected, it's also incredibly hurtful and can seriously damage our sense of community. The First Amendment is important because it enables us to speak our minds and share our honest thoughts. But mutual respect is just as important for a strong community. We need both if we want to treat people with the dignity they deserve. I agree. We need laws in place so that people have the right to express themselves and share their ideas. But we also have to acknowledge the risk of people abusing that right. 
I think our time in this fellowship has shown that responsible free expression is empowering for each and every person, just like the quarterly civic dinners that we host. You're right. Our civic dinners have produced really powerful conversations through civil discourse. We've been able to gather around the dinner table with so many different people and have been able to tackle controversial subjects in a respectful way. No one had to worry about being cut off or feeling judged, which I think has been a liberating experience for all of us. I feel like a lot of our participants, myself included, we've been craving a space where we can have meaningful conversations. A place where we can truly feel like we've been seen and heard. I know. It's amazing what setting a standard of open dialogue can do for a room full of people. I think this setting, and honestly, civil discourse in general, can be really useful in terms of bridging the gap between people who might have different views. It can be hard to listen to people you disagree with, but I know I have a lot more to lose if I don't expose myself to new and different ideas. For me, it's been a process of acknowledging that different beliefs exist and respecting where others come from. Same here. I would have missed out on some pretty cool conversations if I was afraid to talk to people I normally wouldn't speak to. And it feels really good when someone is willing to hear your opinion and respect you enough to engage in a conversation, even if you guys don't share the same perspective. I'm with you. And you guys were right about this cartoon thing. I'm so glad we didn't just send out that lame email. Wait, weren't we trying to come up with an idea for our next blog post? We should probably get back to that. I think we have a lot to go off of now. Maybe I'll write my next blog post about some of the unexpected topics that actually are protected under free speech. Yeah, mine will be about all the types of speech that aren't covered by your First Amendment. Yeah, I think I'm going to write mine on the difference between what's legal and what's ethically acceptable. Just because some forms of speech are legally protected doesn't mean they're ethically acceptable. SCU protects our rights to free speech, but we still have to use those rights responsibly. Yeah, and this goes beyond just SCU. I bet these lessons will be really helpful after we've graduated and are out in the workplace. Knowing how important it is to have a space for open and honest dialogue, I think we all might be more likely to speak up in meetings and vocalize our opinions. Ugh, graduation? <laughs> no, Sarah, you're right. Think about all the ways this can benefit us in a leadership role. Knowing how to juggle different perspectives is super important. Okay, I see where you're coming from, and even not as leaders, just as neighbors and average people, as friends, invoking your right to freedom of speech and civil discourse is really important in those contexts as well. They enhance our relationships with others, foster a greater sense of community, and contribute to our own personal growth. Mm -hmm.